Hello and welcome to another series of Left Book Club's anti-capitalism series with Gargi Bhattacharya. Today we will be discussing anti-capitalism and imagination with three of the most incredible thinkers and writers, um, all under one virtual roof. So massive kudos to Elif and the Left Book Club people for pulling this off. So to give a bit of background about um, what Left Book Club is, uh, Left Book Club is a subscription book club and not-for-profit initiative uh, that seeks to foster a spirit of collective learning and political education. Uh, the Left Book Club wants to create spaces and avenues where people can learn from each other and discuss radical ideas that inform actions and practical steps and also aims to support the struggles fighting for us all. Previous events uh, hosted by Left Book Club have featured speakers like Angela Davis, Rachel Kushner, Kojo Karam and Lewis Gordon who have dis covered, had discussions that cover so many different struggles including movement building and transnational freedom struggles as well as tips on things like how to pitch a book to a radical publisher. So if you'd like to become a member of the Left Book Club, uh, please visit leftbookclub.com. And don't forget to follow Left Book Club on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook and subscribe to the YouTube channel while you're watching us tonight. So to give a bit of background about the event today, uh, in 2020, uh, some of you might remember that the UK government barred anti-capitalist education materials from schools, dubbing it as an extremist political stance. The policy, which has been referred to by commentators as McCarthyist, goes further than any British government has previously gone, even during the Cold War. So Left Book Club have organised a series on anti-capitalism with Gargi Bhattacharya to explore what we're all thinking, which is, why is the UK government afraid of anti-capitalism? Why is it being barred from schools? Why now? And how can we teach anti-capitalism in such a context? So after a popular series intro, we are really thrilled to announce that this month we are discussing anti-capitalism and imagination with Gargi Bhattacharya and incredible guest speakers, Lola Olufemi and Harsha Walia. So to give you a bit of background on our speakers, Gargi Bhattacharya is one of the UK's leading scholars on race and capitalism. She is the author of Rethinking Racial Capitalism, Dangerous Brown Men, Traffic, and also co-author with me and lots of other amazing people um, of an upcoming book uh, called Empire's Endgame, Racism and the British State, which is coming out next month, I think, hopefully, if all things go smoothly. Uh, Harsha Walia is the author of an upcoming book called Border and Rule, Global Migration, Capitalism and the Rise of Racist Nationalism. She's also the award-winning author of Undoing Border Imperialism, which has been an incredibly influential text for myself and so many other of my comrades. Uh, she's also co-author of Never Home, Legislating Discrimination in Canadian Immigration, as well as Red Woman Rising. Indigenous women survivors in Vancouver's downtown east side. Harsha has organized in migrant justice, anti-capitalism, feminism, abolitionist and anti-imperialist struggles uh, and that has happened for the past two decades and she's been also been involved in grassroots movements that a lot of us have heard of such as No One Is Illegal, Defenders of the Land and Women's Memorial March. Lola Olufemi is a black feminist writer, organizer and researcher from London. Her work focuses on the uses of the feminist imagination and its relationship to political demands and futurity. She is the author of the incredible book, Feminism Interrupted, Disrupting Power, and a member of Bare Minimum, which is an interdisciplinary anti-work arts collective. Her forthcoming book, Experiment in Imagining Otherwise, is out with Hadra Press this year. Uh, and we're all really looking forward to that. Hydra Press also provides a subscription service, which is um, really cool as well. So um, to give you an idea of how this event is going to run, we're gonna start with an opening by Gargi. He's gonna talk a little bit about why we're doing this event now uh, and what, what kind of the thinking behind putting this event on now has been. 
Uh, we're then going to hear from Lola and Harsha, who are going to give some of their initial comments and responses. And then I will ask a few of my own questions because I definitely have so much to ask this incredible um, panel of writers and thinkers and people who imagine a way of doing things beyond what we're doing now. Uh, and then I will move on to audience questions, which you can submit by commenting on the YouTube comment link thing, which I think is like around here, maybe. Um, I don't know if that's like right visually, but um, so put your comments in, you can comment all throughout the talks uh, and we will be collating those questions and putting them to our speakers. So without further ado, um, this is what you all came for. I will hand over to Gargi. Um, hi, thanks so much for coming. And as, as always, anyone in the audience who knows me knows that I'm so overexcited by all of this all of the time. And each one seems more exciting. Um, as Dahlia said, really this series comes about, it does come about in response to an attack, but it's not a series that's based around, oh, let's defend ourselves. Oh, the writer saying, don't talk, let us see what they're saying about ourselves. Instead, we tried to think of, the quite strange prohibition of anti-capitalist resources in British schools, which was framed very oddly in a very odd time in British politics, as a backhanded compliment, a kind of backhanded recognition of the ways in which anti-capitalist thought through a range of grassroots movements and different kinds of just kind of flickerings of hope around the place is already filtering into everyday life. And I think most of all in Britain for younger people. So the state saying, <laughs> be quiet now it's kind of it's almost a reading of the moment but it's a kind of off-center reading of the moment so our series is really trying to capture what it is that's being almost recognized by a state that's nothing like ourselves so we wanted to do a session on imagination partly for the element of surprise I'm not the kind of person who normally gets trolled on Twitter because I'm invisible this is one of the ones that suddenly a few people have said oh we don't want famine we don't want authoritarian stuff. I don't even understand what you're talking about but they're kind of assuming that a left um education is automatically a kind of um sub soviet union authoritarian um big empire failed state combination there's it, it pulls something out of the cupboards about what the left and right used to be and we wanted to not start in that place but instead start to think about what are our shared resources across different progressive traditions you know this is not the broadcast of any particular faction or party it's about saying well if we were really to remake the world together all of us very different people what kinds of questions might we want to ask and so one of the questions was what is it we mean when we say imagine a future what is the role of imagination in progressive politics at all and we hope that by the end of this session because firstly we hope you don't have to be an expert you don't have had to been in a factional fight in some sub party of the broad international left for the last 20 years to know what we're talking about if you're slightly interested we hope that we're talking in a way that you'll get a hook into that and think yeah i know what you're talking about i'm interested in that equally if you're someone who's been knocking around the left for the last half a century. Some of us in the room are in that kind of sad position. Um, I hope there's also something unexpected or um, interesting or energizing about us meeting here today. And one of the things we also thought was, these are differently hard times for nearly all of us. So that if we're going to meet online, it has to give us a lift, it can't be if you feel worse after this event, we've not done our, our job because the job is to make us all feel held a little bit. So we're trying to think today about the idea of imagination in anti-capitalism and three big ideas. One about the idea that imagination in an anti-capitalist movement or set of movements is partly just about articulating what desire and hope for a better life is. So imagination is partly building a political language that's forward-looking, moving forward. Linked to that, as I've said, how you feel about things. Imagination is also about how political movements create effective resources, things that can lift us, keep people going, because 
that's also part of politics. Critique is not enough if it makes us fall over and collapse in exhaustion. And also perhaps the one that is most spoken about now is the one about picturing a life beyond, um, beyond this. You know, what might the future feel and look like? How can we use our imaginative practice as part of, part of building the better future here and now? And I'm already talking for far too long, but the two big things that we wanted to just say in case people, well, just as a refresher of some older debates. One is one about utopian thinking and utopian thinking on the left. I much older, very British ideas often about and very European ideas about utopian socialism. I think the Western left for a long time has had a kind of downer on utopian socialism. Utopian socialism is what didn't grow up to be Marxism. And of course, we are all good Marxists, or at least trained to be post-Marxists. There's still something interesting about that earlier utopian socialist moment, and Marx and Engels recognise it, but say, look, it's great to think about how you imagine a better world. That's absolutely about, you know, can I think, look at this ugly world and imagine something better? But you also have to think about how you get there, what's your politics, and who can get there, who's the agent? That's been the debate in the Western left for 200 years. Utopian thinking is all well and good, but where's the politics, where's the agent? What I think has shifted around a bit again, and this other bit of the debate was always there, is what we mean in terms of prefiguration. What, so is utopian thinking just like an escape, like oh, I can't bear this ugliness, let me think of something nicer? Or is it a way of trying to prefigure what a better future might be? And, and I'm guessing because you can't turn around on the internet without having someone talk to you about prefiguration now, I'm guessing that that phrase has been, in, you know, that people will have come across it, that you can't do any kind of platform without people saying, is this or is this not? So prefiguration is a way of talking about how we do something here and now, even though the world is fallen and broken and violent and not what we want it to be but we do something now that already anticipates what a better world could be so we're kind of thinking imaginatively but also doing imaginatively together and some of the things about prefiguration that i hope we're going to talk about today are how you do experimentation so the politics is not just about there's our enemy let me go and storm the enemy you might do a bit of storming but you might do some other more playful, imaginative, experimental, trying things out kinds of things as well. You might think about even how power displays itself and how you can unsettle it. You might think about how doing politics can make people feel different. That's about holding each other, lifting each other, snuggling each other. People will, who know me again will know that class snuggle is part of my secret slogans that I say every time. And also how do we build a politics that even though we're not at the promised land yet, something is happening in the here and now as we try to survive that anticipates a better world. Um, and others, you know, John Narayan talks about the ways in which the Black Panther Party um, talk about survival pending revolution as another model of that. Quite a lot of the talk around mutual aid at the moment talks about that. But these are not the thing itself, but the doing of it is not as a kind of sop to capitalism, the doing of it remakes us and remakes our relations to each other, and it's partly an imaginative journey. Capitalism tells me that my relationship with you is just transactional, completely commodified, that your interests can never be my interests, that we're in a battle with each other endlessly. The ways that we work and live and survive together is partly an imaginative shift to say, well, maybe that's not who we are to each other, and, that, and that's what it means to prefigure a future that we're kind of collectively dreaming of. And within that, the resources of imagination, such as story, song, cartoon, scent, food, hugs, parties, dancing, that's all part of what it means to imagine ourselves differently to each other. And I'm hoping that's what we're going to start talking about now. Thank you so much for that, Gargi. Sorry, I had a scramble trying to find my mute button then, which I think is the, the story of 2020 for so many of us. Um, thank you so much for that, Gargi. I think also, you know, what I 
really gather from that is is that you know so much of that work of of creativity and imagination as a kind of site of, of political struggle it is about remaking the connections that capitalism has broken um whether it's you know between each other between our body our minds between you know our even thinking about you know what the economy is versus what the environment is and all of that and and kind of rebuilding those connections when they've been sort of forcibly broken and, and how we do that is such a key part of our political demands but also our strategy and our our tactics um so i'm going to move on now to lola um who will give her initial remarks their initial remarks and then we will move on to harsha so lola do you want to take it away um, I first want to say thank you so much, um, Mugabe and Harsha. It's an honour to be part of this conversation and thank you to the Left Book Club for inviting me to be part of it. Um, yeah, so I, I, I guess I'll start off. I think I'm learning that any good researcher um, defines their terms. So I think of, I'll, I'll talk briefly about how I think of anti-capitalism and then the imagination, what, it, what it, I think its functions are, how it can help us, um, following on from what's already been said. So I guess firstly, I think of anti-capitalism as primarily a kind of stance against, I, I think it defines itself in opposition to capitalism, obviously a system of economic exploitation that works in service of private profit, wealth accumulation at the expense of kind of human life and human flourishing, um, capitalism that, that creates these differing proximities to violence and impoverishes the working class, creates vast disparities in wealth and access to resources in the production and valuing of goods and the labor required to make them. Um, I think obviously capitalism depends on racialized labor to produce excess wealth for the few. It organizes human life around the market and it builds a kind of ideological state apparatus in order to support its continued existence. Um, and I think that anti-capitalism becomes a, a stand in for lots of ideological political histories and genealogies that um, try to enact that stance against. But I also think it's important to say what we're for uh, as well as to say what we're against. And so to say we're communist socialists um, or if we come from more you know, orthodox traditions, whatever, I think um, uh, anti-capitalism is kind of a broad um, coalition making exercise in a stance. But I think it's also important for us where we can to be specific about our histories and, and ways we would like to move forward. Um, and we shouldn't fall into the trap, I guess, of defining our politics only in terms of what we stand against. Um, so what is the imagination? I think for me, the imagination is a kind of abstracted process of conjuring that which does not exist presently or subjectively. Um, I think it's hard to provide a kind of comprehensive overview of what the imagination is. I know that it requires an engagement with the faculties of, um, of the mind and the, the body. And it's about this relationship somewhat between the real and the not real. Um, but I think what happens is uh, when we imagine beyond what we've been given, as I said um, before, we're recognizing that in the arena of politics, what is deemed not possible about our political demands um, is as much a construction as what we understand to be our re reality. And by that, I mean, um, the certain political po possibilities that are deemed not possible are only not possible because the governing and hegemonic structures and forces that organize our world have told us so. And so, what the imagination does is help us break free from the weight of this ideological state apparatus, which I take from um, Gramsci, obviously, um, and capitalism kind of, uh, yeah, and, and the ways that capitalism produces an ideology to maintain itself. So our political demands and what we see as possible um, are shaped by what we think it's possible for us to have, um, which is shaped again by those um, social forces. And so what the imagination, I think, um, allows us to make a set of demands, but thinking beyond what we've been given in terms of our demands, um, it's kind of the difference between us demanding a four day work week and demanding a world without work or the reform of borders versus a world without borders or between defunding and abolishing the police, for example, um, between you know, state owned prisons and no prisons at all. I think that's, that's where anti-capitalist politics begins to diverge because there are some people who want a socialist state um, and that's and that's it and thinks and think that the political project ends there but there are others who kind of want more and so we we see how um you know when we imagine we begin to make these divergent demands that often end in infighting which i think is you know at the 
at the end of the day, even though, you know, depressing, extremely useful. Um, so then what does, what does the imagination do? I think the imagination provides us with some kind of um, effective impetus that propels anti-capitalist action. So by that, I mean the process of imagining otherwise, of imagining that we could live differently, of orientating ourselves against this world in favor of, of another is a process that spurs us to stand against the state, to begin to strategize depending on the urgency of the moment, to collectively organize, to provide assistance and mutual aid to one another, to keep each other alive. Um, so when we act and when we organize, spurred on by our imaginative faculties, we are one, already enacting the world that we wish to see, as has been said, in, a, a, through a kind of prefigurative um, politics. But something is also, as, as um, Dalia said at the beginning, something is changed in the doing. Our relations with each other change and grow. We're breaking open realms of possibility. And that to me is incredibly exciting because I think often and people maybe think of the future in an anticipatory mode, right? The future is something to come. But actually, when you stop thinking about time in this kind of like masculinist linear way, you see that we're enacting futures even um, as we're seeking to build these worlds, right? Um, and I think the imagination is what makes things like general strikes possible, acts of solidarity, this concept that we take from Angela Davis of continuous struggle. Um, and I, I think the imagination helps us think about politics less as a kind of win-lose situation, but as uh, um, requiring a deep commitment to this belief, right? Call it hope, call it what you want um, to call it. Uh, just to kind of finish off two last points. Um, I think that also what the imagination does is help us understand the world as already in a condition of disaster. And I think the, the reason why the, uh, the imagination has been so crucial to my own politics and, to, and I think to, to feminist politics in particular is it because it's kind of undergirded by a serious ethic of care and of revolutionary love. And I think those often aren't taken seriously enough, but they're, they're also important impetuses that we need to pay attention to, I think. Um, so the imagination has stopped me because I'm thinking or, or attempting to always think beyond. It stopped me from being surprised by the horror of capitalist death machines and so has um, saved me time, but it's also strengthened my resolve in opposing it. So it, it's made me think about the rich histories of internationalism that we have, the ways the imagination has broken the border, has you know shown us that our lives are materially connected to one another. Um, and, and so I think of you know these liberated futures that are often spoken spoken about not as something that I'm awaiting like I said before but as something that requires principled resistance from me now in this moment and I think that that is really what keeps me kind of engaged in you know po these political projects and then finally um, I've been reading a lot of um, Glissant who, who is like a philosopher from Martinique and he has this quote um, where he says let's go openly towards that utopia that we need um, so much and I, I think as often I think the imagination um, as has been said before is kind of dismissed dismissed as not material or dismissed as you know not somehow not serious and I think of the imagine the imagination and material conditions as co-evil and by that I mean they originate from the same place but they also produce and reproduce each other so often um any demand for change I think comes must come from an imaginative impulse because everything about the world as it stands tells us to maintain you know hierarchy to maintain um uh the status quo um so the imagination is is what propels us to act but also when we act um uh we're also pro uh, producing imaginative possibility we show how our reality is a construction um which we have the power to shape and change so it's it's kind of this kind of cycle um that hopefully we intend to keep going so yeah i'll, I'll just end there i think the imagination really is what keeps me alive keeps me engaged um and it, it's what's made me realize that freedom and how we're conceptualizing it is not a, a policy popularity competition. It's, it's this ongoing battle, right? That's gonna require so much from us at any given time. And, and one that requires us to understand ourselves as part of a legacy and not as you know wanting to um, simply win at politics, which I think is a strange way to conceptualize you know, how you intend to live um, essentially. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lola. I think that was incredibly, I think that idea of, of thinking about the imagination as part of a material that, you know, you draw on to get your resilience to fight. But also I think 
I often think that this this idea that that capitalism doesn't have a kind of imaginary element to it is also you know there's nothing more mystical than like the capitalist state and how it operates and there's something about thinking about it in those terms um, and that the the imagination is is a struggle that that you know is a domain of that struggle um, is is so is so crucial. I just also wanted to remind uh, people to write your questions in the YouTube comments. Um, we're collecting those questions and we will be posing them to our amazing speakers once I've had my pop first because you know I'm I'm very very excited to ask my questions. Um, so just before we go to that section, um, we will have our final speaker, who is the incredible Harsha Walia. Hi, thank you all for having me. It's such an honor to, to be in conversation and to listen to you all. And OG, you started by um, very aptly saying that if we don't leave energized, um, then we're not doing our work. And I just want to say I'm so energized already. And we've barely begun. So thank you all for, for your comments and, and your thinking and imagining around this. Um, I'll start by saying that I'm on uh, the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people. The lands that I'm on are the lands of the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Squamish Indigenous Nations uh, who continue to exist, who continue to affirm their, their jurisdiction, their laws um, here on these lands in the settler colonial context um, of Canada. Um, and for me, when I think about uh, imagination, um, you know, I don't just offer that land acknowledgement um, tritely when I think about imagination uh, right away and here located on the lands that I'm on, I think immediately of a number of different Indigenous prophecies that are very much rooted in the practice of collective imagination as a form of resistance, right? What does it mean to resist imperialism, racial capitalism, and more? Um, through the collective telling and affirmation of prophecies. Uh, and one of the many prophecies on these lands is an Anishinaabe prophecy called the Seven Fires Prophecy. And that's a prophecy that, uh, that prophesies that in seven generations, the world would be where it is today, which is that the water would be polluted, the world would be at, at the brink of environmental catastrophe, uh, that people would be on the brink of hunger, and that people would be also on the brink of war and or already in those states of being um, and in those perpetual states of being. And the seven prophecies or the seven fires prophecy um, calls on us uh, to think about what we do when we hit that path. We have the path of continuing down this path of uh, you know, exploitation, extraction, um, endless war uh, and exploitation or another path, right? And that path is the one of imagination where we decide what that other path looks like. Um, so I wanted to start by offering um, that prophecy as an act of what I see as a, a profound act of imagination against centuries of settler colonization here where, where I am and where I'm, I'm speaking from. Um, and I'm, I'm so excited to, to be thinking about imagination for the precise reasons that we've been talking about, right? Which is what, are, what is the role of imagination? What is the role of imagination in resistance? And what are perhaps some of the differences, or, or is there a difference between kind of utopian fatalism and imagination? Um, and you know, when when I was invited to be part of this conversation, um, and of course all the other fantastic panelists being um, located in the UK, uh, you know, the thing that occurred to me was I was like, this is so interesting. The conversation on imagination is happening. Um, you know, decades after Margaret Thatcher declared Tina, right? That there is no alternative. And when I think of what does what is the work of imagination, it is explicitly pushing back against rhetoric like Tina, that there is no alternative. The fatalism that I think is actually baked into capitalism, right? Like that is part of how the capitalist project um, projects itself is of course, all of the forms of domination but also that intimate psychological wear down of that there is no alternative, that this is the only path. And so um, I think of imagination as a profound act of resistance collectively, um, pushing back against uh, capitalism and capitalist austerity and, and everything um, about racial capitalism. Um, you know, right now, the other thing that I'm uh, inspired by is also uh, the resistance in India of predominantly Sikh and Punjabi farmers who have been camped out for months to oppose 
uh, the three farm bills that have been implemented by Narendra Modi in the Indian state. People may have heard about these farm bills, so I won't go into a theoretical kind of analysis about them. Um, but what has struck me and struck many others is that, you know, of course, this is this is a resistance to the Hindutva, the Hindu nationalist agenda. This is um, resistance to the Indian state. This is, of course, resistance to capitalism um, and the privatization of the farming sector. This is resistance to, uh, you know, completely decimating people's relationship to land, not only to economic production, but also one's relationship to land, which capitalism distorts, right? Those social relations to land. Um, but also, uh, you know, if you listen to interviews by farmers who are out there in the cold, many of whom have died of hypothermia, many of whom are elders, um, what many of them talk about is the sick idea of chardikala. And chardikala is the idea of being an eternal optimism. And eternal optimism is not this, you know, again, this kind of cheesy idea of like, the world is great. But it is how do we remain eternally optimistic in the act of resistance? Um, and and Chardikala also calls um, in that context to call on the imagination to imagine and to continue us to assert and affirm a different way of being. So these are all on my mind, at the top of my mind, uh, when I think of, of the work of imagination. Um, and then I would, you know, I would stress, as, as we all have, just how important that act is as a form of collective and continuous struggle. Um, Asada Shakur, um, the great former political prisoner and a fugitive currently living in Cuba, um, she says that, quote, dreams and reality are opposites, actions synthesize them, right? So dreams and reality are opposites, actions synthesize them, which I see is really critical to this conversation around imagination, which is how do we take that collective freedom work of imagination and dreaming and think about action as that which synthesizes that. And you know, Lola already talked about all of the ways in which profound acts of resistance, abolitionist struggles against cops and police, you know, imagining a world with no borders, with no cages, with no walls, with no police, with no prisons, you know, that is fundamentally work of the imagination because part of the carceral regime and part of state violence is similarly you know, so wrapped up in the idea of Tina, right? So, so the ability to do work to imagine safety outside of policing, outside of borders, outside of prisons is inherently imaginatory work because it means that we are dismantling and delinking the idea of safety from the carceral state and that requires care and imagination and all of the different forms of work of community accountability, of community care, of relational work, of kinship work, all of the different modes that that takes and as, you know, as has been said, that's a feminist ethic of care that's rooted in disability justice, that's rooted in you know, the labor of racialized communities, that's rooted in ethics and relations to land, uh, to non-human beings as well, to all species, that relational work, that intimate work, that work of how to be human again, <laughs> right? The work of how to be human again, where our interdependencies are celebrated, where we're not reliant on each other in an extractive way, in a commodified way, in a competitive way, where we think of interdependence as something other than extraction, right? If I think about my relationship to most humans on this planet, who makes my clothes, who grows my food, that is a, a relationship of extraction, not one of my choosing, but it is nonetheless, I'm bound up in violence to most human beings on this planet. So to think about how to be human again, to think about how to be in relationship with one another again, and not in a flattened, we're all equal way, of course, but like in a truly, how are we going to dismantle how are we going to dismantle oppression so that we can genuinely be in communities of kinship and interdependency? That is fundamentally a deeply intimate and revolutionary um, project of, of emancipation and imagination. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the few quotes that I want to um, offer as I wrap up here, because I think it, you know, again, speaks to this idea of the imagination, um, is the Zapatista saying, which is, we make the, po we make the path by walking. We make the path by walking, which also then speaks to prefiguration, right? Which is that we make the shell of the world we wish to see in the world that we're in today. And Eduardo Galeano similarly said, you know, and he's talking about utopia. And he said, utopia is on the horizon. I move two steps closer. It moves two steps further away. I walk another 10 steps and the horizon runs 10 steps further away. As much as I may walk, 
I'll never reach it. So what is the point of the utopia? The point is this, to keep walking. And Eduardo Galeano and the Zapatistas were not in conversation with each other when they said these, when they said these things, but I think um, you know, that they're both speaking about the same idea. Um, and Lola, you were talking about, you know, the way in which Angela Davis talks about freedom as a constant struggle. Robin Kelly talks about freedom dreams. Um, all of these invocations of freedom as a constant collective struggle, as a path that we make, uh, that talks about prefiguration as utopia, I think are, are profound. And I'll end with the words of Mariam Kaba, you know, when, who, when she talks about hope, she talks about hope as a discipline. And I think if we think about hope as a discipline, I think it calls on us to, to act. It calls on us to remain hopeful, but not in a way that is um, fatalistically utopic, but that calls on us to take up those challenges, to take up the immense task it is to dismantle capitalism, both in the kind of material sense of how power operates, but also in the intimate senses of how we're, we're in relationship to each other. Um, so I think those are those are some of my thoughts around um, imagination, and I'll you know I'll close with what I think is one of the one of uh, one of many um, slogans that I think is also deeply imaginatory in the context of struggle, and that is you know Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. Thank you so much for that, Harsh. I think you know starting with that Margaret Thatcher quote. I also was thinking about her other quote, which is that. Um, economics are the method, the object is to change the soul, which I think tells us so about how integral so many of these questions are to political and economic transformation and that the other side definitely know how important these questions are. So it's really important that we have these kind of strategic and political conversations surrounding, surrounding these topics. So um, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions to uh, our incredible speakers. Uh, and I'm just gonna remind you guys to pop your own questions into the YouTube comments so that I can also communicate what you guys wanna know about uh, as well. So my first question is that uh, it kind of seems that that neoliberal austerity has, has pushed a lot of our political movements into becoming about holding on to and defending the small things that we have. Uh, so whether it's our local library or having a pension or a health service um, in the case of the UK in particular at the moment. And it can feel like that leaves not that much bandwidth to imagine different futures at the same time as trying to defend things that are quickly becoming the past. How do we work through that contradiction? And, and do you, does the panel think that that is a contradiction at all? So, uh, Gargi, can I start with you? Just because we haven't heard from you in a little while. <laughs> okay, put my put my mic back on. I, th I think that's really interesting, and also speaks to why, partly why we're doing this whole series, but also why particularly imagination. That um, one of the ways that capitalist violence works is it sets the it sets the terms of politics, doesn't it? I mean, we've been talking in other places about you know, the attack on anti-capitalist thought, the, the so-called free speech debates, all of the ways in which the right gives us the terms and then we, you know, as we have to run around and defend. And then that takes our time, energy, it places us in position to each other. And it kind of, it's like we're always a little bit late to the party if we're always in defensive mode. But I wonder if the level of the crisis we're living through is making even those attacks force everybody into something different. I think something is the spread of the move away from we must defend um, basic services because the, of the attacks on, of austerity to no one is coming to save us but ourselves. What can I do? That's a that's a big political journey that's been hugely compressed in the in the worst of circumstances for us. But history has compressed it for us, and it makes it no longer a defensive gesture, you know, I'd suggest. Partly coming actually out of a certain kind of hopelessness about engagement with the state, you know, that nobody is coming for us. I think that's very visible in Britain and I think across Europe in different ways that what might have happened 25 years ago when you're always kind of like, can we twist it around to policy? Lots of places in which there is no policy, you know, there's no interlocutor for a debate about policy. Instead, the recognition of the attack is to say, 
well, what would it mean for us to save each other in the kind of productive mutuality and independence that is not, not demeaning to any of us? That, that forces our imagination because of the question of survival. And I don't wish to, I know I always sound like a bit like, oh, bad times are coming, how exciting. That's what kind of, that's also a kind of left bad habit, isn't it? Oh, a crisis, more crisis, good, then we're gonna win soon. But I also do think that um, not, not in the Namby liberal clap on the doorstep way of Britain, but instead just the everyday amazing resources of mutual survival that are being pulled out of every nook and cranny, that that's something like what a collective imagination towards another life might look like. Uh, and I think it kind of doesn't matter so much how the, the right shapes the attacks now, because the level of the question and the urgency is so widely understood and is leading to such different practice that I think that's the space many progressive people feel we should be in. Not countering, but instead saying, look, it, it, people are practicing it already in bits and pieces. What, where's our space within that? Thank you. Um, Lola, would you, would you like to respond to that question as well? Just gonna go in the order of the speakers. Yeah, um, I think it's a really interesting and really complex question. And I think, maybe it's about rethinking the reasons why we do act in those kind of basic services, right? That like when we're stopping the domestic violence shelter from closing or when we're like attempting to save local resources, we do so precisely because we, we're, we imagine beyond them, right? I think maybe there's this way that our politics is perhaps stuck um, in a kind of binary thinking about you know what is possible i.e like all of our energy goes on saving these local resources and so there's no energy left to think beyond but i feel like a lot of the people that i know are engaged in that in that principled resistance one precisely because they imagine otherwise but also as a kind of journey or a stepping stone to to um what they see as you know on the horizon however they demand that and so i think you know, yeah, there's, I, I think there's a trap in that kind of thinking because it depends on like, what wins are we getting, you know, like we're constantly on the back foot. And that always surprises me actually when I, I I, I personally am like, who do we mean when we talk about the left? There are so many different lefts operating at once, but I feel like that there is a certain sect that is, is kind of obsessed with, um, uh, selling us the future, obsessed with selling, you know, the state, obsessed with selling uh, uh, electoral politics. And I'm just kind of like, when and when that inevitably fails in ways, they're like, okay, we've lost, we've lost, we've lost. I'm like, of course we've lost. Nothing about this world is geared towards our winning, right? Nothing about this, this world is anything but hostile to those freedom dreams that we're putting forward. And so I think it, it requires us to rethink why we do things, right? We don't just defend the local service we, we defend it obviously so it continues existing but we don't just um defend it in service of the political party right we defend um we defend it because we understand it has a material effect on the way that people live and we understand that after the, after the work of defending it there is more work to be done after the work of you know the political party the doorstop the whatever there is more work to be done um and maybe often maybe we get we get lost in the kind of like do we have to bypass it all of the fighting about that and i and um in in a way i'm kind of deeply ambivalent to that because i, I recognize that a, a politics that is um a, a, our contemporary politics should respond number one to the urgency of the moment but it should also recognize that the struggle is long as you said before and that there's a, there's so there are so many more fights to come right so i don't i, I don't know maybe that it was a kind of roundabout way of answering that but i don't think it's a question of bandwidth i think it's a question of reassessing where the impetus comes from, from in the first place essentially yeah, and I think that question of, of why we do things, I think that's a question that any of us who were involved in, you know, in the myriad of ways that we were involved in, in the Corbyn project was really came up all the time. And I think especially the fact that it was always the more imaginative politics of the, the idea that, you know, we could like, of, of 
McDonald talking about reparations or of talking about, you know, uh, no borders, that was always a thing that was most punished um, by, you know, not just the media, but even by our own alleged comrades. Um, and, you know, things like even just having internet for all kids was seen as like so utopian that it needed to be punished so that it could never be uttered again. Um, and so, so made to feel so, so embarrassing. Um, and uh, yeah, so Harsha, do you have any um, thoughts on that particular question as well? Sure, yeah, and thank you for that, that great question. Um, and I'll say that the context within which I'm, I'm thinking through this is perhaps less political parties and more, um, you know, kind of mainstream campaigns or <laughs> the nonprofit industrial complex, et cetera. Um, but I, I would agree that I think the question is less bandwidth and the question is less even this kind of debate about reform versus revolution, which is a very real debate. Uh, but picking up on Garji, you know, when you were talking about the Panthers earlier, uh, when they talked about survival pending revolution, right? And the distinction between reformist reforms and non-reformist reforms. Um, and I'd echo, you know, what Lola is saying, which is that there are struggles that are material that are not simply reformist because they are not expansive, but they're necessary because they speak to the urgency and the material needs of the communities uh, that we're fighting alongside, that we're part of, that we're rooted in. Um, but I think there's an important distinction between reformist reforms that kind of um, re-entrench and reinforce the power of the state uh, and that are kind of demobilizing in the long run. And you know, here I'm thinking about say policing or prison or immigration reforms uh, that just throw more money at the system, right? And just buttress their power uh, versus non-reformist reforms, which challenge the state by opening up the possibility of freedom, right? And so, you know, a kind of, and I, you know, I have lots of specific examples because, you know, coming from an organizing perspective, as many of us do, this is like a constant tension, right? Like, are we going to really spend all of our time doing this one thing when there's this, you know, you're playing whack-a-mole, right? If I fight this one deportation, what about the thousands of other deportations um, that we have to continuously fight? And that is a real, um, it's just a, it's a, it's a question of, of capacity in that real sense. Um, but I think there's a few things about that. One is that the process of struggle changes us. So this is not just, for me, it's not just about these kind of abstracts about what we pick and choose or what we don't. It's that the act and the, and the act of being in struggle together changes us and makes it more possible to take on more fights, right? It empowers us, for lack of a better word, and I, I don't mean that in the nonprofit empowerment way. I mean it in like the truly um, grounded sense of struggle and comradeship and kinship. So that practice of struggle changes us. So I think it's always important to be in struggle um, in ways that are materially part of our movements and our communities. And the other is, is to be part of struggles that open up the next stage of struggle, right? If struggle is continuous, what is the struggle that takes us one step forward rather than one step back? And so I think that's more of a tactical struggle and a tactical decision and a strategic decision um, rather than one that simply falls kind of in the dichotomy of reform or revolution. It's like, how do we pick a battle that opens up the space for freedom and emancipation rather than set us back. Um, and again, in the context of the carceral state, you know, that means freeing people from prisons. That means getting people, you know, defending people from deportation and not agreeing to reformist reforms like, oh, okay, sure, we'll free people from detention, but we'll put an anklet, you know, uh, GPS monitoring on them. Like we're talking about, you know, no conditions, actual freedom status for people. So I think there's those kinds of distinctions um, that are important. Um, and, you know, when we're fighting for services, it, it um, I, you know, there is the contradiction about fighting for state services and fighting against the state, but it is also part of the process of allowing all of us to say, hey, actually the state isn't here for us. How do we create these kinds of networks of care for each other? And how is this also part of the struggle against austerity, right? How do we see the state and capitalism not actually as opponents to each other, but the state is actually deeply embedded in the capitalist project. And I think that's another part of those contradictions that unravels in the process of struggle, right? People start to see that it's not about multinational corporations just gutting away and privatizing. The state is complicit in that the state is the state is the home of capital relations. Um, and it, you know, it legalizes them, it entrenches them, and expands them. And so um, I think it's through that process that those um, seeming dichotomies get get worked out, and those um, debates are, are hopefully are, are fruitful in the context of struggle. 
Thank you so much. And I think, you know, relating to that, that idea of, of doing as being kind of part of that process. Uh, my, my next question, my last question before we go on to uh, the comments, which by the way, are absolutely loving class snuggle. Um, I think for a lot of us, the, like the biggest dream is to hug someone that we don't live with at the moment. Um, so I think that's really resonating with people. Um, so my next question is drawing on your own experiences within movements and within that kind of um, work or movements that you've studied. Can you think of examples or moments when that possibility of thinking and doing imaginatively has materialized in ways that keep you going today and continue to fuel you in your work today. Gargi, should we start with, with you? Oh, see then it's like I should have prepared because I thought I was going to ask that question, not answer it. And I guess actually you and me, Dali, we've talked about versions of this before, about the ways in which strange fleeting moments in any um, political life can somehow kind of boost you like it's like, it's like a kind of endorphin hit kind of make you go oh. um or, or I've, I've said before that um those moments when you suddenly feel like we're falling in love with each other again i mean collectively the kind of rush of emotion and that can be suddenly being in a big sea crowd or it can be in an event when suddenly something happens that just twists the power relations or it could be in something tiny when something happens between you and that glimpse of something that's not um, extractivist as Harsha says just suddenly comes onto the tape it can even be in the silliness that it, I know that it's not what you're talking about but the book that me and Dahlia are involved with with our, my younger surrogate family so much of that was truly miserable but very very funny and I think the moments when you laugh in these despairing moments in any kind of politicized context is also something that it opens something different so I don't think it's like it's a tactic, but it's something jouissance, I think. Jouissance is a phrase that comes from a, a much older set of feminist theory about a kind of sexualized but not sexual pleasure that erodes the boundaries between you and others. And I think liberationary politics has a kind of jouissance floating under all the bits where we fight and sell papers and go and have to do the drudgery. There's that kind of, and it erupts in moments. And it's those moments of eruption that we need to both, I think, recognise and value and try and expand and share, because that's what that's what keeps us going. So that's not quite, it's not like, oh, go and read this, which is what I thought would be good, but it's still an idea. Great. Lola, do you have any responses to that? Yeah, I really, I really love this question. I think for me, um, there, there's lots to draw on, like historically and in the contemporary moment um i think of like i think of like groups like oad for example the bricks and black women's group the like grunswick strike i think of all of the kind of direct action campaigns that were launched from a place of kind of collective feminist thinking and um from that you know ethic of care that i spoke about before i also think about um black women's organizing against land grabs in places like brazil kind of anti-gentrification movements like in the uk as well thinking about like focus e15 for example thinking about sisters uncuts um uh, occupation of holloway prison those for me are all kind of sites and moments where possibility are born and and in my work i kind of look at archival material but I think it's actually really important to obviously engage in revolutionary histories. I think all of the, I think of all of the work that Claudia Jones um, did and all of her kind of internationalist, her, her uh, specific focus on internationalist struggle as um, paving the way and breaking open our sense of, you know, what we could demand. Um, I think about specifically how she opened up kind of Mar Marxist thinking to understand, you know, the, the position of the Black woman worker as indicative of, um, you know, economic relations, indicative of our, of our relations to one another, for example. And, and 
her critical intervention in that way made it almost impossible to, to think about class struggle and um, capitalist exploitation without also thinking about race, um, without also thinking about gender, all of these ways that capital um, uh, reproduces itself in, in, you know, in co-constitutive ways because of these, um, uh, the places where people are positioned. And so for me, um, yeah, those those are all moments that I kind of look back on and moments I can draw on and moments that remind me that the, the part of the task is not to concede to the um, to the reality of the present, you know, and I think that that's that's something that's um, embedded in abolitionist organizing. I think of Jackie Wang and, and um, the way that she writes about prisons and the way that she writes about the heaviness of the present of the contemporary moment and um, not giving into that heaviness, not allowing yourself to, um, to be crushed in a way and not allowing your sense of what is possible to be shaped by what the world tells you is possible, which is actually like an incredibly hard thing to do because often you're, you're trapped in these cycles that seem to constantly reproduce um, themselves with nothing, with no kind of end in sight. Um, but yeah, that, that for me, um, uh, th those are the moments that I continue to, to draw on when I'm... Um, when I'm tempted to fall back into a, a cynicism or I'm tempted to fall back into to believing these myths that we're somehow not organized enough, we don't have the resources, we're not scaled up enough. I just don't believe those things to be true because I see the ways that people have kept each other alive in this moment. And I think often we imagine politics as a kind of unified, neat, singular, forward movement. And it's like, you know, it's that Diane de Prima thing. It's gonna take so many of us from different angles, pushing at the thing to bring it down. Um, and that that brings me great comfort, really. Thank you so much, Lola. Uh, Harsha, did you have any any thoughts on that question before we move on to, to the commenters? Um, sure, yeah, I, I would um, agree. I mean, I think there's so much to, to draw on <laughs> in terms of inspiration and grounding. Um, if there is one uh, kind of internationalist movement that I would point to in this moment that I've been thinking about a lot um, lately that keeps coming to me and actually are the, uh, the, the inheritors of the, you know, the tremendous legacy of Claudia Jones uh, were the Black and Third World Women's Caucus within the Wages for Housework movement. Um, and really how they made, you know, use that rhetorical device, but to really make clear, as we know, that there is no capitalism that is not gendered. There is no capitalism that is not racial, there is no capitalism that is not rooted in sexual violence, right? And, and conversely, that there is no anti-racist, uh, you know, feminist struggle that, that isn't anti-capitalist, um, that capitalism is inherently racial, gendered, and specifically anti-Black, anti-Indigenous. Um, and so, you know, when I think about that caucus within the Wages for Housework, the ways in which um, they came together to really make clear the internationalist connections and various forms of work that domestic work is, you know, many kinds of reproductive labor, including in factories um, and sex work and more. And so uh, that work, I think for me, um, continues to ground and inspire, but really just, you know, so many movements who engage in direct action, who call on us to constantly think beyond the confines of the state, beyond the confines of racial capitalism, beyond the confines of you know, trans misogyny um, that really are emancipatory. And I think, you know, if I could just point to one in the immediate that's um, local for me, that is not local, but <laughs> uh, local and for my context is um, there are tent cities, right? So tent cities of people who are houseless, who come together to squat or take over either private or public property, both in an act of defiance and resistance um, to capitalism, to, you know, the very concept of private property, of course, um, who are addressing a material need coming together to create conditions of housing for one another, but also in the process of collective living, which increasingly in the Canadian context, you know, the Canadian context of social housing is very, I mean, first of all, it's being whittled away, but in as much as it exists is very, um, you know, that kind of authoritarian, top-down, state-managed, individualistic, commodified version of housing. And so the act of coming together to not only create housing, to not only resist the commodification of housing, but to also come together and live together 
to create processes by which one communes, by which one, you know, by which people make food together, create um, ideas of how to live together, how to create communal safety, because this is a highly criminalized space um, to create safety for, you know, people who are using substances to people who are trying to get clean to, you know, women on the streets who are sex working, people who are trying to exit, like just a range of experiences and needs um, that people are creating in the process of living together um, is just, uh, I just cannot overemphasize how emancipatory and how liberating and how much that has to teach us um, about living together. And again, you know, those, um, those intimate and invisible networks of kinship that we need to sustain us, right? Because so much of burnout is not like the doing, it's the feeling. And so what do we need to do to feel together um, in the process of struggle? Yeah, Gaki, did you want to come back on that? I, did, I just wanted to say this brief thing and I was thinking of when all of us were speaking, but I think, well, of course, because of the event and we're kind of, um, looking through our resources of hope and energizingness but i think we're all in different ways also describing the ways in which um imagining a different way of us living together is also for us all to acknowledge that we are frail and broken and weak and needy because i think especially if you hear people speaking it's like oh that um so when i was um, harsh was saying you know hope is a skill you know it's a practice that it's um it's not a practice like the stronger can do it and you're if you're feeling hopeless oh how weak I better go and do my hope burpees till I bulk up a bit because you know I understand that many people at home partly what you've come for is a like a kind of um faltering in in your hopefulness and I think we're all of course feeling that feel it all the time anyway and partly to build an imaginative future together is find practices where we can hold each other in that and that's absolutely part of it that we are all broken because we live in a world that chooses to break us but that's what we are imagining ourselves beyond yeah and i think i i love that idea of i think you know that question of of doing of direct action as being such an important site of that because i guess that's kind of what direct action is it's kind of doing things that you haven't been given permission to do and kind of seeing how it unfolds and it's messy and it's difficult and it's it's not you know and I think also not being not having and this links to so much of what you've said Lola of like not being afraid of like quote unquote failure because you don't conceptualize it even in that way um the process is part of it and that is such a a, a key part i think to to and thing that has connected so of what so much of what all of you have sort of said um today so i'm now going to move on to some uh comments as questions i'm gonna group these into two um and then put them to you i've tried to kind of connect them a little bit but sometimes i i don't know how good i've how good a job i've done of that um but the first sort of cup couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, does the current crisis provide scope for collective imagination to, tr to challenge the existing capitalist paradigm? And then a kind of connected question to that is, um, how do we uh, live the breadth of our imagination in terms of care and radical transformation while still trying to shift the mainstream left? So I guess that's both those questions kind of speak to a, a kind of, you know, the moment we're in, whether it's, you know, the, the crisis of the health crisis, or I guess the crisis of the mainstream left, both are certainly in crisis. Um, what kind of scope within there is, within that is there to, to mobilize that kind of the question of collective imagination? So uh, Lola, shall we start with you first? You oh God, those are two such big questions. <laughs> um, I think right now I've been thinking I, during the pandemic, I've been thinking a lot about the social reproductionists and how they are right and how they've always been right, but have been kind of um, th their theory has been looked over, right? In terms of like, what are the life making um, uh, reproductive uh, uh, capabilities that, you know, create the worker or create um, our ability to go out and then be exploited by, um, other people, because what we're seeing is, um, like the question asks, a kind of crisis of 
care in this um, current moment. We're seeing people being forced back into their homes. We're seeing people having to, um, to retake on childcare. We're seeing relationships crumble because of the force of being with each other 24 seven. And we're seeing actually how work structures our entire life. I was actually, the bit of a tangent, but I was talking to my mom about uh, uh, how, how this crisis has shifted her conception of work. And she was saying, you know, I've realized that actually we fill the day with all of this stuff that we don't need to do. Like we could get the work done in like three hours and then all go home. And I was like, well, yes, why is that? And I, and I, I say that to say, I think the scope for, for challenging the capitalist paradigm um, rests on our ability to encourage people to question the way that um, they, the, the way that we lived before versus, you know, in some ways how we're being um, forced to live now, you know? Um, I think it's interesting to ask people, you know, how, materially, how is your life different? But also, how can you see the way that um, your working life is constructed or the way that your time was um, spent commuting or your time was wasted doing X or your time? How has this um, and, and obviously this isn't the same for everybody, but how has this crisis shown you? Um, that your life is organized in a, in a very specific way. And then I guess on, on the, the backside of that, it's also getting people to think about how the government has literally abandoned them in the middle of this crisis, right? And to, and to not do ourselves this service of giving the government or the state the benefit of the doubt in a situation where they absolutely do not need it. We are in such dire um, a, such a dire position in our country, right? And I think one of the things that um, will be important to us, will be important for anybody who cares about these liberatory futures, is to not forget that but like Boris Johnson went on the TV and said, some of you are going to die and there's nothing I can do about that, right? Um, and so when the, the government or when the state begins to tell another story about this pandemic, or to tell a story about its behaviour during this pandemic, I think one way that we can challenge that capitalist paradigm is by remembering actually know what they did and how they acted and how they framed their actions um, and and let that inform our strategies like moving forward um, and I think um, on the second question of how do we kind of live um, the breadth of our imagination and, and stretch and challenge the mainstream left I think it's yeah I think it's a difficult uh, place to it, it's a diff it, it's difficult to think about right um, but I also I think it comes back to that question of reminding people that things actually can be had for free and reminding people that, you know, the mainstream left will continue to um, tell us to demand less or continue to chastise us for um, asking people to use their imaginations or to think bigger. Um, and that actually they are, like some of them um, have to also become, we have to start being critical of them as well once they start getting in the way of that wider project, right? Because you can you can be part of the mainstream left or you can believe in you know responding to the urgency of the moment and still be a block, still be a barrier to what comes after. So I think it's about, you know, ma maintaining a critical relationship, but also not investing all of our energy in attempting to, to shift a, a mainstream left and putting that energy elsewhere, putting that energy um, into solidifying the links and the relations that we've had to make in, in this moment out of a, a kind of pure survival, I guess. Yeah, and I think that that goes back to that idea of, of doing differently and that being one of the key kind of tactics that we have um we have for um in our sort of arsenal i guess uh harsha did you want to did you have any comments on that those two um questions about both the current health crisis and also um the the question of living that breadth of our imagination in terms of care while still trying to main shift the mainstream left which i guess is also the in ngo industrial complex <laughs> i guess that's sort of refer referring to that yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of space um, for uh, political imagination and and doing in the current crisis. And, you know, I think that's really kind of captured in in this kind of general refrain of, you know, we can't return back to a normal, right? Like the post-pandemic cannot go back to quote unquote normal, um, which I think for different people means different things, but really kind of is a collective 
recognition um, in the in the least that you know what we had before just didn't work for people. Um, and I think there is absolutely, um, as Lola is saying, you know, a kind of reckoning at, just at that kind of daily level of like, wait, why did I have to go into work and commute for two hours and now suddenly I can just do this from home? Um, or, you know, how did I exactly that? How did I spend my time? How was my time and my work organized? Um, and also, of course, very much bringing to the fore about, you know, what kind of work is really not essential work in our lives, right? It is work to create more capital. Um, versus what is the care work that underpins the reproduction of life itself, right? Um, everyone involved in food and care work uh, and janitorial work and everything in between versus the kind of tech bros who just make money to make money or real estate developers, right? So what is the work that is actually sustaining life and required for life? And what is the work that is to create capital? Um, and so I think those kinds of questions in different ways um, are percolating for people as well as, you know, I kind of personally fluctuate between my God, this is like offensive and okay, maybe this is like a window <laughs> for people, but you know, this feeling of like we're on lockdown, right? So what might that mean for people to realize what lockdown actually is, right? Like we are not actually incarcerated in our homes, but you feel that way. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit offensive that you're equating being in a lockdown in your home as the same as being under a form of incarceration, but perhaps that is a way in which people are starting to recognize um, that there is a cruelty and just a deterioration of one's humanity, one's mental health, one's physical health um, in these kinds of conditions of forced confinement, right? Um, and so I think all of these questions uh, that people are tending to and thinking through in different ways uh, and that, you know, no new normal speaks to the possibility of, um, of a, a different path forward, but of course that very much relies on, you know, the state remakes itself all the time, right? We have been in crises before and it doesn't mean, and every time there's a different kind of crises, there's this, I think in the left, there's a sense of, you know, this crisis is terrible, but hopefully the crisis will like lead to something new. But of course <laughs> that's not always the case because power, you know, power remakes itself, reconstitutes itself, tells its story and justifies itself. So. Um, I wouldn't be so naive as to think that this will be the time necessarily. And that is ultimately, that is our work, right? That is our work of how do we expand those conditions of possibility. Um, and in terms of the, sec the second question around breadth of care, um, I do think there's a tension there because I think, of course, what we're seeing is expansive networks of mutual aid and communities of care, right? Where people are increasingly, as we've been talking about, realizing that the state has abandoned them that capitalism only cares about itself, that people's, you know, people's lives have been made expendable, some of course more than others, literally, people are, are, are left to die in ways where you know, that death is, is accelerated. Um, and so mutual aid has kind of um, filled the, those vacuums for people, right? Um, in different ways at a neighborhood level or beyond that. The tension I think is of course, is how do we scale up mutual aid? How does mutual aid become something larger, more sustained, more expansive? Um, you know, one of the traps, I think, in the kind of most practical ways is mutual aid can often be exclusionary, right? It's like, who's got the largest pod? Who has those existing networks to rely on people? Um, and so how do we actually scale up mutual aid? Not to the, you know, we're not trying to supplant the state. That's obviously not the goal of it. So I don't mean scale up at the macro but I mean, make it truly an emancipatory process. And, you know, I think we also can't be, um, we can't be romantic, you know, we can't romanticize it, right? Like it is a lot of work. It is a lot of work to be present and work out the act of living, to not have to default or rely on someone else, right? Those processes are hard and time consuming. And, you know, you know this is like a, a, a kind of a stereotype, right? But it's like, no one wants those long, never ending meetings of the Occupy movement. <laughs> We're like, why are these general assemblies going on forever and what's happening here? Um, so that practice of mutual aid that involves that kind of democracy in the truest sense, not you know liberal democracy, but a participation. Um, I think we can't uh, underestimate that that is a, a, a really hard, it's just a hard thing to do. Um, and that, you know, that takes practice, that takes care, that takes skill, and we, we haven't been trained in it, you know, like, and again, the practice of, of being is not inherent to any of us. It's, you know, it's because of the world we live in. 
Um, so I, I think there's a lot of possibility, but I also don't want to, in my view, romanticize just how difficult that is. And I say that knowing that many communities have for a very long time uh, been abandoned by the state or lived outside of the state or been fugitives to the state and have figured that out, right? So I also don't want to suggest that that is new because these are also inherited practices. Um, but the question is, you know, how to grow them. Thank you so much. I think also, you know, that that question of, I don't know if this is the conversation that happened in North America and Canada, but the in Britain, there was this like really interesting window just when the pandemic started where conversations around work and essential work and what does it mean for a work or worker to be valued and who decides that and what implications does the decisions around that have um it feels a little bit like that window has kind of passed but i also think that the conversations have planted seeds that are not going to be take cannot be reversed um and i think that that is is a the remembering of that as lola kind of pointed out um is so important and it's going to be so integral um going forward so um the last two questions that i'm going to put to the the panel because um we don't want to go too over time um so the broader thing is how do we learn to imagine um i think it was mentioned that capitalism dictates what is imagined to be possible how do we begin to imagine the impossible um and is imagination a function of knowledge and then sort of related to that of, of you know, the work of imagining differently. Um, given that cities have erupted as a way of organizing the production of capital, would cities continue to exist in an anti-capitalist imagination? What would anti-capitalist urbanism look like? So, Gargi, should we go with you first? Okay, thanks. Well, I love both those questions. First, I was thinking about, um, when I was a lot younger and I got I got taught literature for a while, one of the things was reading, you know, in Alice in Wonderland, you know, I working to believe three impossible things before breakfast. But part of the left is about training ourselves. And I think we need to think about what training in what is pleasurable in the moment while we wait to, for something better. And also what training ourselves in forms of knowledge which are not as people are indicating they're not the mainstream institutional forms of knowledge are they but we might use some of those knowledge practices that some of us have gathered from um, different kinds of institutional spaces which often kind of treat us badly and make us feel bad but say this is the only way to know the world and there are some skills from that but it's also about what our collective resources to know the world are and how they can be shared in a way that people feel held and safe enough to say, this is what we don't yet know. This is what we could imagine. I kind of am I'm actually imagining a whole different way of thinking about political education as not a uh, filling in of a background, but a kind of learning to pose questions. And I wonder if there is something that for all of us about, um, I'd actually at work in, you know, in, my, in my still for a few days more professional life before, well, they may or may not, get me out of that workplace but um trying to say that perhaps one of the things in terms of thinking about research practice as not an elite practice but an everyday practice is the ability to um identify a problem and transform it into a question which actually i think is potentially even that's a kind of skill-based thing that i do in as a teacher i also wonder if it's if it's a kind of way of thinking that we collectively should insert into our ways of of mobilizing because certainly political education that I've been um, familiar with doesn't teach people how to think the next thing necessarily or, or that's meant to happen automatically isn't it you learn the traditions and you'll be inspired and then the next thing will happen so I think oh yes there's something about that especially in this differently ruined world we're, we're living in so, you know I, d I don't underestimate how difficult it is to do anything you know it's difficult at the moment for people to put their pajama bottoms on basically isn't it so everything else is a kind of plus on top of that but um but there are choices we make about how we speak to each other and what we say the agenda is and some of that is about even saying to each other well if we framed it like this there's a question still to be answered who could take part if we said these are the questions we've already asked um what would it be to imagine something completely un unlike that what would that be even just different game playing i think there's something about 
reintegrating playfulness and games into political life, which is part of it. It kind of happens inadvertently, but maybe we should just say it to each other. And perhaps within that, experiments with anti-capitalist urbanism are also kind of part of that. I'm sure, I, I don't know who's in the room, but you know, people will know that there's a whole group of people in the world who are looking at what, what would urbanism look like if it were not just a bulwark of capitalism? Because urban spaces um, offer that proximity, they offer the concentration of people, that all the things that make them the centers of capital are also the, make them the centers of democratic experiment. And there are traditions that people have, are already trying to resurrect. And there's also something about mapping a space that actually whatever the right across the globe says doesn't really belong to anyone. You know, the cities should not be easily um, recuperable into nativist narratives. I know they are all the time, but there's something, you know, because ev everyone is coming to the city, aren't they? It doesn't matter if you said, oh, my grandparents were there. There's something about the space of the city that allows a kind of shift around. And I think there's, um, that's it's part of the critique of um, older utopian socialisms, isn't it? Oh, that all of these, um, characteristics of capitalism they're all ugly and horrible and made on violence so we'll destroy them all and we'll imagine a kind of older pastoral semi-feudal background as if you know break it all down because we couldn't have any of that i think anti-capitalist imagination it's not my friend everyone has said it already anti-capitalist imagination are about the fun and games of living in the ruins of capitalism not breaking not there's not a field underneath I can get to the beach, but I'm not, you know, I'm not going to suddenly start dressing like a milkmaid. It's not that kind of fantasy of a post-urban. I think instead it's like, what would the urban be? And also to kind of just understand how already varied, extensive and borderless the urban is. Maybe not so much in Britain, but globally. The urban is already kind of washing in and out of other spaces. Part of what's happen happening in India is about that difficulty, isn't it? The difficulty of pretending that there's urban India and rural India and that oh, one will sift resources into here and the others will just think, oh, thanks, farmers, starve and die. The boundaries of capital have made those spaces differently and people are already experimenting in ways of supporting each other and what meaningful democracy would be. So I think we need to kind of find the spaces in that. Anyway, that's a whole, that should be a whole other session, actually. We should do something about cities. Whoever in the room said that, you should drop me an email and we should have another session about anti-capitalist urbanism on another day. Yeah, for sure. I think that's such a crucial, crucial, like, topic. And I often think that if you want to see real experiments in different kinds of living, just go to Holloway Road and you will see boundaries being broken, borders being smashed in all kinds of ways, <laughs> for sure. Um, Harsha, did you want to respond to, to those questions? And then we will finish off with Lola. Sure. Um, I'll start with the, yeah, the, the second one. Um, I mean, I, when I think, I guess, concretely, of anti-capitalist urbanism and movements, you know, I think about the right to the city movement around the world. Um, and I don't know if folks are familiar with that in that context, but you know, the right to the city movement really is um, anti-capitalist thinking about who has the right to the city, right? What are the ways in which cities have been built? What are the ways in the city excludes? Um, who has a right to claim the city, particularly in relationship to um, property, the right to live, the right to access services, anti-gentrification struggles, you know, heightened struggles against police violence in, uh, in cities. So I just, I think about the expansive way in which right of the city movements are thinking about at the city in so many different ways, right? The social organization of the city um, and relationships in the city. So, you know, that's what comes to mind kind of concretely. Um, the one thing that I do think is that is important um, in terms of anti-capitalist urbanism, and I, you know, I think there is a bit of a um, there's a bit of tending to that I think happens in that urban-rural divide, right? Where there's a resistance to saying anti-capitalist, you know, anti-capitalist movements are kind of hearkening back to pastoral ages or you know those kind of stereotypes um, of quote unquote primitive living, etc. And then I think there's also the the very real reality that a lot of anti-capitalist you know, resistance in land-based communities 
are opposed to the social organization of the city precisely because of its relationship to the land, right? Whether that's indigenous communities, farming communities, or peasant communities, and the ways in which cities have been built not only to, you know, ferment for, or built around the extraction of capitalism, but also a very specific relationship to land um, and what that means. And so, uh, you know, I'm a little bit more weary of the kind of rural, the rural urban divide. And I, you know, I echo that those boundaries are, um, they're quite borderless, right? Like again, those, those, those communities are bound up uh, and in relationship to each other in many ways and people move across those spaces for many different reasons. It's not, it's not simple. Um, but I do think an anti-capitalist urbanism would kind of bring together um, and, and recognize the multiplicity of what the city means, right? Both the right to the city and the relationship of the city to the land um, and what that might mean. So I, I think there absolutely is a need and a thinking about that. And, you know, maybe that's specific because I'm in the context of Canada, right? Where there are very real um, conversations about, you know, what is the role of the urban, for example, in indigenous land struggles? And conversely, what is the role of land defenders in urban struggles against police violence and state violence, right? So that's a very real and fruitful and generative conversation. Um, and then I think, uh, you know, I would, you know, echo this, this kind of thing around, um, the asking of the questions. And, you know, I, I uh, mentioned the Zapatistas earlier, though, you know, we make the path by walking. Of course, one of the other things that they say is walking, we ask questions. Um, and, you know, just leave it to the Zapatistas to leave us with answers that are, that are, you know, I won't say non-answers, but that, you know, force the answers back on us, really. Um, and I think that, for me, really, is that, uh, that, collective, that collective space. But I wanted to actually, um, and I, and I think, I actually was thinking about this, and now these two questions kind of tie it together for me. So I'll, I'll end um, with a short piece uh, that Satyu Sarangi wrote. And Satyu Sarangi uh, was on a hunger strike for many years in the early 2000s, and he was part of the Justice for Bhopal campaign. So the Justice for Bhopal campaign being a campaign um, that sought justice and continues to seek justice for the victims of the Dow chemical disaster, one of the largest industrial disasters that we know in contemporary history in Bhopal, India. Um, and while he was on hunger strike, I'll just read an excerpt. Uh, he wrote a, a short piece, um, and I was thinking about it today around imagination, but I think it, it fits into these questions as well. Um, and I'll just, I'll quote from him. So he says, or he wrote, you will try to draw me into the Plato of practical life you will try to draw me into the Plato of practical life. Tell me that not only God, but all the religious and irre irreligious leaders are dead. And I will tell you that across the forest lives a young man who calls the earth his mother. You will give me the boring details of the rise of state power after every revolution. You will give me the boring details of the rise of state power after every revolution. And all I can tell you is that in our tribe, we still share our bread. Thank you so much for that, Harsha. Uh, Lola, would we, you like to finish us off before we close the event? Yes. Um, yeah, these are two really great questions. Um, so on how we learn to imagine, um, I think for me, learning to, learning to imagine and treating imagination as a function of knowledge requires us to kind of loosen our allegiance to the tenets of this world. So to the tenets of nation, gender, how you understand yourself, to the fictions of race. Um, yeah, to, to kind of loosen uh, your attachment to the kind of governing structures of this world and the story this world tells about itself. And by that, I mean to understand that in these worlds, these new worlds that you're seeking to build or, or um, that you're attempting to enact now, you won't get to keep anything. You have to, I think you have to really be prepared you know, like when we're thinking in the spirit of revolutionary change, you have to really be prepared for that to happen tomorrow. And if that did happen tomorrow, you know, where would you be? You know, what skills could you offer? How would you look after other people? Um, how could you keep yourself and others going? I think that that's a really important question for people to ask if they want to begin to kind of cultivate the imagination. How much could you give up? Like, what are you willing to sacrifice? Those are all key political questions, I think. And I also think, um, 
that when we when we understand knowledge, we also have to understand that our conception of what counts as knowledge and knowledge production in the West, especially, is underpinned by you know this enlightenment rationalist thinking that is you know the product of white supremacy, the the product of imperialism, the product of a specific kind of um, conservatism, and so the imagination is asking you know us to not only rethink but to absolutely smash the very tenets of how we come to understand things um, and so before we can even think of the imagination as um, a function of knowledge we have to rethink what we understand knowledge to be and where it can come from and i think what the imagination kind of gives us is this, this, ab this ability to kind of feel with our bodies to be in communication with one another to get knowledge from all of these other different places that aren't just about what we can see smell touch here you know um, yeah, and I, and I think when we recognize that we lean into abundance, you know, like not to be, I don't believe in like accelerationism, but I think it's, I, I do believe that we can live better, we can live in a way that um, centers human flourishing and, and that there would be lots and lots for everyone, essentially. Um, I think on, on the second question, yeah, it's a really interesting question. Like, I, I don't really believe in like returns to atavistic society or like, it's just, it sounds a bit racist to me. <laughs> but I think when I think of anti-capitalist urbanism, I think of people like June Jordan, who in the 70s tried to redesign Harlem with Buck, uh, Buckminster Fuller and how she, she recognized that like place and space were important and that the city is not only, you know, a physical thing, it's also an ideological project. Like, like has been said, before it defines who can walk within it who can be a flaneur who, who can enjoy city space without being stopped searched deported etc so i do think that actually the city as we understand it now won't stand but i do believe i i do agree with um uh, gargi that um you know will be in the ruins of the city and we will change the city by existing in it um in, in a changed state you know existing in it in changed material conditions and so even though even if we're in the city as we once understood it we won't it, it won't be the city it'll it'll be something else that we haven't yet been able to con conceive of and and i take that from i, I think about black squatters movements in the, in the 80s i think about figures like olive morris and how they showed that you could just take housing if you didn't have it and that's how i think the ethos of an anti-capitalist urbanism would operate right that people could have what they would what they could take from the ruins um because it all belonged to them anyway the city is no longer this based on certain exclusions essentially um yeah and i think about like districts and zones i think if you live in london everybody knows the difference between boroughs and how that can map out your life expectancy i i certainly know that um and so yeah so I, i'm thinking about the kind of embers and what we can build from the embers in 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 a kind of Stuart Hall way right like that every um th thinking about the notion of reconstruction that every destruction is also a reconstruction which I think is what you know the imagination teaches us but yeah I'll stop there thank you so much Lola I think lots and lots for everyone is a fucking incredible political slogan <laughs> so well done for coining that one um, so thank you all so much this was such an energizing conversation and it's been an absolute gift to be under the same virtual roof uh, with you all. One minor silver lining of these kind of online events is that we can have, there's just like more spatial, like bound, the spatial boundaries of who can be where has kind of like in these kind of events has, has gotten a bit bigger. Um, so just a reminder that this is part of a series of, of events on anti-capitalist political education. Um, the February session is going to be on anti-capitalism and love, um, very seasonal. Um, and so you can find out the details for that and when it will be announced and the opportunity to register for that by following Left Book Club on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. So you'll get the most up to date uh, information on those pages. And you can also uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel, which will also notify you when new videos, are new live events are being scheduled. And if you want to actually become a member of Left Book Club, which is a sub book subscription uh, service, then visit www.leftbookclub.com. Uh, there is also gonna be another event hosted by Left Book Club on the 4th of February, um, which will be a conversation about education and pedagogy. Uh, and that will include uh, people, uh, Farbets, who is a member of the Landless Workers Movements, 
uh, someone from the National Education Union who have just won a really incredible um, union dispute just recently in the pandemic and a member of the World Transformed and a member of the World Transformed, which is uh, a big political education initiative in the UK. So if you want to tune into that event, which is on the 4th of February, the Eventbrite link should be in the YouTube comments, but you'll also find that link on those Twitter and Facebook pages that I mentioned beforehand. So um, once again, I wanted to massively thank all of our speakers, not just for their amazing words today, but also the work that they put, they put in uh, throughout their lives in these very questions. And I also wanted to thank all of you guys for showing up today in what is, you know, difficult circumstances and, you know, we're all kind of tired and fatigued, but we didn't give in to that. And we came together um, for this event and had um, this incredible discussion. So thank you so much to our speakers and thank you to all of our viewers and thank you to Left Book Club for putting on this incredible event. See you all later. Bye.